Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sophia Halkidis, and I'm a data analyst here at Citizens Committee for Children of New York. Um, I'm on the research and data team here, as I mentioned. So we use um, both research and data to inform child advocacy in New York City. And we also maintain the largest database on child and family well-being in New York City called Keeping Track Online at data.ccnewyork.org. Um, and all this stuff is possible through census data, hence our purpose for being here today. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to talk about this stuff. Yeah, so um, a little bit about the presentation we'll be going through today. Um, we'll be sharing a little bit about who we are as an organization um, briefly and then share a little bit of information about our Every Child Counts New York City, uh, which is CCC's uh, 2020 census campaign. But the majority of this conversation will be to highlight uh, and identify through the data lens uh, challenges and issues surrounding the 2020 census and how we hope to address and work towards uh, getting out the count and ensuring that all young children are counted uh, in New York City. So a little bit about CCC. Um, so C Citizens Committee for Children of New York is a nonprofit and nonpartisan child advocacy organization. Um, we work to educate and mobilize New Yorkers to make the city a better place for children uh, using our advocacy um, that combines public policy research and data analysis with citizen action. Um, so we work really to cast light on the issues impacting children and family well-being throughout the city to educate the public, engage allies, partners, and stakeholders, and identify um, the practical solutions that ensures every New York City child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Included in this work for this year, uh, CCC is also focused on the issues surrounding the 2020 census. Our campaign, Every Child Counts a New York City, um, works to advocate for a fair and accurate count of all children living in New York City by educating and mobilizing youth and adults um, to reach the goal of providing the information and the tools needed to ensure that children are counted and not erased in the 2020 census. And three ways we do that work, are going to be doing that work in the campaign. The first is to educate and inform community-based organizations, community leaders, and other advocates on the 2020 census and the undercount of young children in New York. The second is to mobilize youth, uh, and we do have um, engaged youth through our civic uh, engagement programming, but also are connected to partners who uh, work with youth throughout New York City. So it's connecting with um, youth in our organizations and youth in other partner organizations so that way they may be ambassadors advocating on children, the children's on the count issue uh, and supporting get out the count efforts either with their peers, their families, or communities. And third, it's really about the all hands on deck approach and joining the other partners and advocates to ensure that New Yorkers have an understanding of the importance of the census uh, and also mobilize so that way we get a complete count um, for communities, families, uh, and young children throughout New York City. Some examples of the partners that we've been working with and will continue to work with are the New York Counts 2020 Coalition, uh, Naleo, uh, the Count All Kids um, Census Campaign, which is uh, through the Partnership for America's Children, um, and uh, another example would be the complete count committees through the borough president's offices um, for all five boroughs of New York. So this graph uh, we feel represents what we consider to be the main statement of the problem. Uh, that is uh, over 1 million children were undercounted in the 2020 census. As you can see in this graph, the net undercount rate for young children is more than three times what it was in 1980. And since that time, 1980, it, uh, the young children's undercount has gotten worse with the undercount rate, um, while the undercount rate for other groups have improved. Uh, another reason kind of why we have this specific focus on young children is a, the difference seen between these two graphs is that when we talk about the undercount of all children ages 0 to 17, we don't see kind of um, the true impact that's uh, occurring unless you separate those two age groups. But as you can see in this graph, while all children, uh, the undercount is 
minus 1.7%. For young children, it's minus 4.6%. Uh, and the other reason is that in CCC, our work has primarily been around uh, children and family well-being uh, throughout New York City, and we found it appropriate that uh, with the census, we also have that lens and framework in mind. Okay, thanks, Carlos. Um, so I'm going to dig in a bit deeper here, and I'm going to pick off where Carlos left off and talking about um, the undercount of young children. So when we talk about that 1 million children that were missed in the last census, it's important to note that not all children are counted or rather undercounted at the same rate. So here, this chart shows that um, young Hispanic children had the highest undercount rate in the 2010 census, uh, followed by young black children, and again, all young children at um, negative 4.6% undercount. Uh, so Latinos are more likely than non-Latino children to live in hard to count places like multi-unit buildings and high and buildings with a high portion of renters and to live in complex families and households such as multi-generational and highly mobile families. And in a little bit, I'll get into why those characteristics might make someone more likely to not respond to their census form. But contextualizing this in New York City is really important because in New York City, more than a third of the child's population are Hispanic or Latino, and nearly another quarter of children are um, Black or African American, which means that around 60% around of children in New York City are Black or Latino, um, which is something to consider as we look at these rates and trying to make sure that we ensure an equitable count. Um, another important fact to mention is that the undercount of young Latino children is almost entirely concentrated in five states, including New York City. So in California, Texas, Florida, Arizona, and New York, those five states make up 72% of the net undercount of young Latino children, which is really important for us to flag as we are trying to make an important um, improvement on the undercount of children both in New York City and across the country. Uh, so a lot of folks might be wondering, how do we know that there's an undercount, right? So how can we know that the census counts are not accurate? Um, so this is done through a combination of birth records, death records, and net migration estimates that are used to determine the number of children and people more generally living in a geography. So here I have a chart from 538, and it shows this kind of illustration of how the Census Bureau missed, um, knows it missed a million children. So to check its survey count, the Census Bureau added up the 21 million birth records from, from the five years leading up to the 2010 census and adjusted that number by subtracting the death records and adding 240,000 to account for the net international immigration, um, which resulted in an estimate total of 21,000 children aged zero to four. The 2010 census survey was only able to count 20 million children aged zero to four, which shows the one million children different less than the estimated totals. Uh, so that's just kind of quick graphic on how we know that there's an undercount. But what I figure is the crooks of most people's questions today is why is there an undercount of young children at all? Uh, so just quickly, there's not one reason why there's an undercount of young children as relative to other age groups, but the, more, the most complete reasons is really that children are overrepresented both in hard to count households and in complex households. Uh, in fact, children under five are one of the hardest to count populations in the census. So hard to count. This is a word that we continue to bring up and that is brought up a lot when we talk about census. Um, and so here's a framework for how the Census Bureau looks at hard to count communities by kind of focusing it into these four buckets, right? The first one being hard to interview. So in hard to interview might be folks whose participation in the census is hindered by language barriers, is hindered by low literacy or lack of internet access. There's also folks that are hard to locate. So this might be people, children, families who are living in housing units that are not in the frame for which the census is sending out um, addresses, sending out the mailing invitation to participate, or persons who wish to remain hidden, who don't want the census knowing their whereabouts. Another category of hard to count is hard to contact. These are folks who are highly mobile. This is children, family, fam uh, households that are experiencing homelessness, physical access barriers such as gated communities. And last, there's the hard to persuade. This, this might be folks who are suspicious of the government, who don't trust government forms and have low levels of 
um, civic engagement. And as you could imagine, children can be found in any and all of these situations. Um, so children may have parents who fall, who, who across multiple of these buckets. In addition to these, there are certain characteristics that have been shown that makes families less likely to include their child on the census. That includes families who are living in rental units versus homeowners. Um, age of householder is something that makes somebody more or less likely to respond to the census. Uh, people who are living in large cities are less likely to respond to the census than those in smaller cities. Those who are living in multi-unit structures and even folks whose address were different a year ago than it is today are less are more likely to be hard to count. Um, so this is just kind of one one way of looking at hard to count situations. But another way is through complex households. Uh, so this is highly prevalent. In fact, in 2010, two out of three missed children lived in what was called a complex household. So this is another diagram of uh, the ways that the Census Bureau kind of type, type, breaks down um, complex and non-complex families into these bucket categories. So um, non-complex families includes nuclear families in which there's a householder, a spouse, and a child. STEM families include a single parent home, and non-family households is when a householder lives alone. All other variations of family types are what the Census Bureau classifies as complex. Um, this might be a blended family, so a family that has a step a step uh, parent or stepchild. It could be a multi generational family, a parent a family where there's only a grandparent responsible for the young child, unmarried families, or really any other type of family. Uh, so basically, all these variations represent a lot of households in New York City. And what's really important to highlight about this is that. Children are much more likely to be missed when the person who fills out their form is not their parent. This might be biologic or adoptive parent. So in other words, when grandparents or other relatives or non-relatives fill out the census, uh, they're, more, they're less likely to include the young child on the census. As a matter of fact, the most common misconception that children under five aren't counted is because they live in households that fail to complete the census entirely. But the reality is, that most people who complete, who children, who left children out of the census lived in households that did complete the form. So of the missed children, only 16% lived in an address that wasn't included in the form. The remaining 84% 80, were missed from being left off the form themselves or in addition to other members of the household. So these are things that are really important as we consider which types of families need to be most informed on the message of the census and when and why they should include their children on it. So another thing um, when we talk about obstacles to a complete count of young children is thinking about language and digital accessibility. So many communities fall into that difficult to interview category. And that includes families with language barriers, with low literacy and with limited English accessibility, internet accessibility rather. So in New York City, 56% of children live in a household with at least one foreign-born parent. This is often households where people might speak in a language other than English. Um, it's also important to note that 49% of New Yorkers speak another language than English compared to 22% nationally. Um, I'm sure it's no secret to anybody on this webinar today is that New York is home to one of the largest immigration po immigrant populations in the country making this issue incredibly salient for our communities and for our children and for a complete count. So I'm going to um, show the language, um, the languages that the Census Bureau will be offering in 2020 to cover this really quickly. And this information will also be shared after the webinar. Um, so the Census Bureau will be providing the internet self-response um, factor in 12 non-English languages. So this is the way that the Census Bureau um, will have the majority of people fill out the form is through the internet form. So this includes 12 non-English languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Russian, Arabic, Tagalog, Polish, French, Haitian, Creole, Portuguese, and Japanese. These languages will also be available for questionnaire assistance. But when it comes to the non-response follow-up, the people who are going into communities and talking, to, knocking on people's doors and asking them to fill out their census, those folks will only have materials in English and Spanish, which will make it difficult to potentially connect with some of the um, individuals who will need other language support. Additionally, the Census Bureau will be providing language glossaries and guides and identification cards 
for um, filling out the form in these additional languages. Um, so this will have, these folks who speak these languages will have some language support, but um, folks who do not will, will have less access. Uh, another thing to mention when we talk about the young child undercount is to talk about internet accessibility. Um, so in 2020, while households still can receive a paper census form, the Census Bureau has heavily invested in the digital form being the primary method that people complete the census. But internet access isn't a reality for all families in New York. Race, age, disability status, employment status, language, and a lot of demographic factors factor into the rates of subscription. 81% um, of households in the United States currently have household broadband subscriptions, but again, this varies significantly. And I just want to show this map here of um, the census tracts um, with access to broadband, household broadband services. You can see that across the country, there's so many different shades where many census tracts really have less than 50% access to household broadband. In New York State, we see that in a lot of places, um, only 75% of folks have access to broadband internet. So these things are important considerations for thinking about who's gonna have access to the census and how they can access the census. Um, in New York City alone, there's gaps in household internet access. More than a third of households in Borough Park and the Lower East Side have no internet access. Um, whereas in some communities, less than 5% of, of households have, have internet. So it's important to remember these differences between communities. Another thing that is an obstacle when we're talking about the young child undercount is that misinformation about the census is prevalent across the board. Remember, 86% of missed children were simply not included on a form that was sent to their homes. This points to the idea that some people are confused about when they should include their child on the form and or that communities don't want to report their child on the census form. So here we'll discuss the former. 28% um, of respondents and households with young children reported being extremely or very familiar with the census. This means that about two thirds of households are really unfamiliar, households with young children rather, are unfamiliar with the census. Um, the chart on this slide really shows people's responses to questions that they were asked in a Census Bureau study called the Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators Study. This is a nationwide survey of 50,000 households and it covers a wide range of topics related to census participation and completion. And the Census Bureau uses the results to understand people's barriers, attitudes, and motivators across demographic subgroups um, to responding to the census. So in this chart, respondents were asked to answer 11 true or false knowledge-based questions about the census. And it's important to, to look at these trends because beyond what people thought the census was used for, it's important to point out how many people were unaware of the main functions of the census. So, for example, most people knew that the census is used to determine changes in the population and Congress. However, there were misconceptions about other uses. Like 10% of people incorrectly believe that the census is used to locate undocumented people, and another 37% didn't know if the census was used this way. Another point is 6% believe that the census helps the police and FBI to keep track of people who break the law, and 31% of people were unsure of whether or not the census was used this way. Um, so these points of misinformation are critical to effective messaging around the census because um, when people are uninformed about the uses of census data and uninformed about the way that it benefits them, they might be less likely to fill out the form. Additionally, they might be less likely to fill it out incorrectly um, or you know, exclude people from the form. So that is um, just one aspect. So kind of alongside the challenges with information Sophia mentioned, there are also concerns uh, about privacy uh, and distrust um, towards the government. I think something um, that we know is that a digital census and increased use of technology in general augments an already existing public concern about privacy uh, and confidentiality with the 2020 census. Fear and mistrust of government among people of color and other marginalized communities has a long history rooted in trauma. Um, something that has continued with the recent actions taken by the Trump administration that places these communities at risk of a more severe undercount in the 2020 census. Something important I think that we need to remind ourselves though is that 
there are protections in place that assure and safeguard the information that um, people provide to the Census Bureau. Title 13 of the US Code was created because of this concern and it regulates the privacy information gathered in the census. And we know that this law is one of the, the strongest privacy guarantees uh, the federal government has um, to protect information. Yeah, and here I, I featured another table from the CBAMS report, the Census Barriers, Attitudes and Motivators study, but this one was specifically focused on comparing households that have young children, so children below the age of five, to households without, without children, young children. Uh, so the estimates in, in being concerned about confidentiality is what's being measured here. So the percent of folks from different groups that are extremely concerned or very concerned about confidentiality in the census, um, the estimates generally range from about 17% of people being very concerned to about 42%. And some, some main findings is just that all racial and Hispanic origin groups were more concerned that the Census Bureau wouldn't keep their answers to the census confidential than non-Hispanic white respondents. Um, families with higher incomes were less concerned about confidentiality on the census. And um, a greater proportion of respondents with less than a high school diploma and households with young children were also very, were very concerned about the census. Last, um, and in line with what Carlos had mentioned, a, great, a greater number of respondents who speak another language um, or who are not English proficient were very concerned about confidentiality, which also, you know, is compounded with problems about language accessibility. Um, so these families, you know, are less likely to ultimately report their children on the census and result in this undercount that we um, have seen. Um, so now we want to pose this question uh, and look a little close, a little more deeply at why does the undercount of young children matter? Um, so there are three reasons that we want to highlight over the next couple of slides. The first is that census data is used to dis how, how census data is used to distribute federal funding. The second is how census data provides information to local government uh, as they think and consider uh, plan changes for communities, including your own community. And the third is uh, how census data is used to determine how many seats uh, in Congress each state gets. So like Carlos mentioned, it's about funding. Um, census data will drive resources for the next 10 years, which is most of a young child's childhood, right? So in fiscal year 2016, New York State received more than 73 billion through 55 federal spending programs guided by data from the 2010 census. This includes a bunch of programs that are um, used to support children and families, such as WIC, Head Start, Child Health Plus, SNAP, and the National School Lunch Program. This also includes the Maternal and Child Health Services Block Grant and the Child Care and Development Block Grant, which distribute, um, combined with some other programs, about 20 billion annually to states and localities based on, on census counts of the population of children under five. And what's important to note is that most of the programs that are apportioned by the decennial census are designed to help the same people who are likely to be undercounted. Um, so when we talk about the census, we are inevitably talking about funding. And to kind of give scope in New York City, um, some quick facts about New York City's children taken from um, Keeping Track Online or data.ccc New York is that there's about an estimated 1.7 million children living in New York City, that's children zero through 17. 52% um, of New York City's children are insured by Medicaid or Children's Health Insurance Program, which are a federal program um, funded by the census data. 21% of New York City's residents use SNAP to supplement the cost of food for themselves and their families, another program that's um, using census data. 20.2% of students in New York City's public school have a disability, and 13.2% were classified as English language learners. Um, and this is important because what's at stake with the census is, is more than funding for programs, but also funding for changes in community. Um, so the census provides information to local government for changes in the community, and it's important that children are counted in the communities that they live, because census data determine so many things like planning and urban land use, the creation of parks and other recreational spaces, also highway planning and construction, um, planning for hospitals, for nursing homes, for clinics, and the location and funding of other health services. Also distributing medical research is dependent on census data. Um, where new schools are going to be built, where 
funding will go to help pay for teachers, for textbooks, and for other educational expenses are based on census data. Um, delivering goods and services to local markets and planning for transportation services. These are all things that are based in some way off of census data, including also directing funds for people in poverty, um, planning health and educational services for folks with disabilities, and you know, states, localities, businesses, and others use census data to plan where to put and where to open new stores, new schools, et cetera. And then policymakers, researchers, and policy analysts use these census data to understand how people are faring in the United States. So ultimately, our kids lose when vital community resources like schools and like hospitals dwindle because they're critical to the long-term success of all children. An undercount can lead to crowded classrooms, to underfunded programs, and to misleading research. In the 2010 census, um, children in Arizona, children un in, under the age of five were undercounted in Arizona by 10%, and they were overcounted in North Dakota by 2.1%. Therefore, a young child in Arizona might not be afforded the same resources as a similar child in North Dakota because census data are used to distribute these funds. And at the core of our democracy, the census is about fair representation. Um, apportionment is the process of dividing the seats in the House of Representatives among the 50 states based on census data. And children are included in the population totals that are used for these congressional reapportionment and also for the drawing of legislative district boundaries. Um, here we have a chart of showing the seat, the congressional representation in New York State by census year. And New York has lost two seats in the last census and 16 seats since 1910. We stand to lose two more in 2020, which means fewer people who will advocate for New Yorkers' children in Congress. Faster growing states like Oregon, Arizona, and Texas are likely to gain seats. Another piece of this is that states like New York use census data to redraw the boundaries of state legislative districts, which impacts the representation of your community and your state. When children are undercounted, political rep boundaries might not accurately represent reality, and those children's needs might not be represented or prioritized according to their real share of the population. An accurate count gives places stronger political representation, federal, state, and county, and school board districts, as well as better data for planning and information on child and family well-being. So let's not forget that, you know, the 2020 census and why it matters is also about civil rights and the fact that children and families should not be erased. So by having communities, individual uh, and people take part in their civic duty, uh, we will all help drive the representation and funding resources for the next 10 years in our communities. Again, in another, in another words, another way to say this is that that's a time period for most of a young child's early life. By doing so, we'll have fair, proportionate voting representation in our democracy that depends on valid census data. And that's why the census is required by the US Constitution. Federal agencies also rely on the census and the American Community Survey de, uh, Service data to monitor discrimination and implement civil rights laws that protect voting rights, equal employment opportunities, and more. We also have communities of color, urban and rural low-income households, immigrants, and young children who are all at risk of being missed at disproportionately high rates. Being undercounted deprives already vulnerable communities of fair representation uh, and vital community resources. So next, we want to discuss a little bit about what opportunities and tools are available for you. Um, the first that we want to highlight is that through this process and in our campaign, uh, CCC uh, has created community district profiles using information uh, via CCC's online data resource, data.ccc.org. Uh, and we've created profiles for all 59 community districts in New York City. What these profiles do is they highlight um, the share of households in each community who may face barriers to participating in the 20 census. 20 census. Some of those barriers including limited English proficiency or lack of access to broadband internet, as well as low income households and households headed by a single parent who are at risk of being undercounted, which contributes to the undercount uh, of young children. So 
in uh, the next several weeks, um, as our campaign site launches, uh, anyone will be able to access these community district profiles via that web page. So if we go on to see um, what that might look like, So via on that landing page, um, to download a community profile, um, you'll visit the campaign um, web pages. Uh, if you don't already know what community district you are in or what community district your organization is in, um, there's a link here that will be able to um, direct you to a, a New York City site where you can input your address so that way um, you can pinpoint directly what community district you're in. And as you can see here, we have um, all 59 community districts broken down um, by borough. So you'll be able to see Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens, and Staten Island, and be able to download that information and share that resource with members of your organizations, community groups, or other stakeholders who want to know more uh, and are inquiring about um, key data points um, that intersect with New York City communities. Next, um, there are a couple of ways um, to get involved uh, with census campaign efforts. Um, the first is to learn about the census and the ways that it benefits your communities, families, and the state. Um, we are going to be making ourselves available through our campaign to support different community groups, community leaders, and organizations uh, to learn and, and be informed about challenges surrounding the census, think about the strategies and approaches that they can take, um, either with CCC uh, and with our partners as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we partnered with uh, New York City Counts 2020 Coalition Naleo, the Count All Kids campaign um, by the Partnership for America's Children, and many more groups that are all working together to ensure that there is a, an accurate count of young children in New York City. The second way is to talk about the census to your friends, families, and neighbors. I'll be sharing a little bit more about the tools um, and the strategies that might be available through our upcoming events. But essentially is that we are all in some way trusted messengers to particular communities that we're connected to. So it's about identifying what ways we can all um, speak to our neighbors, our friends and family members who might live or um, be in hard to count neighborhoods or might be a person who we'd wanna do outreach for so that way um, they can complete their census or get the support they needed to be able to do so. Um, and the third tie to this is that we want to ensure that census forms are filled out, whether it be online, at home, using the paper form, or at community spaces such as libraries uh, to mobilize so that way we ensure that um, folks are connected to those resources to be able to complete their census forms. The fourth way is to participate in your borough's complete count committee. Um, CCC has been in touch with each of the borough president's offices and are working um, to be a part of these committees so that way we can be informed about um, what some of the nuances or approaches each borough in New York City is taking. Uh, taking. Um, as well, we'd be happy to connect anyone uh, to any of these committees if they'd like to participate. Um, the fifth is if you know of anyone that's interested in applying for a census job, you know, again, reflecting on getting trusted messengers out there, that includes the jobs that the Census Bureau is hiring for. Um, on a rolling, the Census Bureau is currently hiring um, on a rolling basis and will be continuing to hire for positions. So if your organization um, has groups of people, community members who are searching for jobs, or like to be uh, fulfill that role as a trusted messenger, this is another opportunity to do so. And lastly, um, partner with CCC. Um, there are going to be a number of opportunities that I'll get to in the next slide um, relating to the 2020 census, but CCC is more than happy to go and present either at our site or your organization or your community group uh, about the 2020 census. Um, or to involve or bring in organizations who'd like to work with us um, towards the campaign. 
We have a number of upcoming events, two of which I'm going to highlight relating to the census. The first is a census advocacy and mobilization training where we're really going to get into the different approaches and strategies we can take. So that way we mobilize different groups to get out the count efforts uh, and to work towards our aims for uh, the undercount of young children. The second is that city is work, um, CCC is working to bring together different census partners uh, and city groups um, to host a census forum uh, in November of this year. So we're currently in the process of outreaching to partners who might be involved in this, but this would be an opportunity to bring in a majority of the stakeholders who are working towards the census issues and connecting them to folks who are interested in, in learning more and thinking about what those concrete strategies are so that way we can mobilize um, for the census occurring next year. Uh, and lastly, if you wanna keep up to date with any of our um, other events, there's going to be more uh, added to this list, but you can visit our site, cccnewyork.org backslash events to view our events calendar. Make sure you stay up to date and look at it periodically because we're going to be continuing to add um, additional events that might be of interest to you. So um, in conclusion, kind of being counted helps young children thrive via stronger political representation, more funding for key programs that support children and families, more equitable distribution of those funds, better data for planning for schools, roads, and other facilities, and better information on child well-being for the next decade. So I guess we want to open it up now for questions um, for our attendees. Again, you can um, enter your questions via the chat, uh, the Q&A box on your Zoom, or if you're joining us by phone, feel free to unmute and um, speak to the group. And if anyone's talking um, right now, we're not hearing anything, so just send us a message on the chat box if that's the case. Well, in the case that there's no questions, I just want to wrap up by saying that, you know, census data is going to be used for the next decade, which again is most of a young child's childhood. Um, and these effects for the next decade are ever, ever stretching. Um, and last, children can't fill out the census form themselves. They depend on just adults to do it as they depend on adults for all their needs. So we need to make sure that our children count. And so we need to count our kids. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoons. And again, if you have any other questions, feel free to connect with Sophia or myself. I did see one question. Uh, in terms of a copy of the slides or the overheads, we'll be sharing um, this webinar uh, as well as additional information um, within the week. So if you haven't received that information by the end of the day on Friday, please do connect with us. Um, but with that, thank you um, and enjoy. Thank you.